town meeting. At this time, the town clerk will read the call of the meeting. Good evening. <laughs> town of Killingly, annual town meeting, Monday, May 6, 2024, to be adjourned to machine vote. The annual town meeting of electors and citizens qualified to vote in the town meeting of the town of Killingly, Connecticut, shall be held pursuant to section 701 of the Killingly Town Charter in the auditorium of the Killingly High School, 226 Putnam Pike, Killingly, Connecticut, on Monday, May 6, 2024, at 7 p.m to consider, modify, and or approve the following. Ordinance approving the operating budget for the Town of Killingly for fiscal year July 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2025. Be it ordained by the Town Council of the Town of Killingly that in accordance with section 1005 of the Town Charter, the budget for the Town of Killingly, Connecticut for the fiscal year July 1, 2024 to June 30th, 2025 in the amount of 24 million 535,618 allocated to the general government and 47,508,839 allocated to the education for a total combined budget of 72,044,457 to be adopted. Kinley Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman. Resolution setting the dates, times, and places of the annual town meeting and adjourn annual town meeting machine vote on the 2024 2025 budget ordinance. Pursuant to section 1007 of the town charter and section 7-7 of the general statute, said meeting at its conclusion will be adjourned and the aforesaid ordinance as submitted or amended will be submitted to vote upon voting machines scheduled between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. Tuesday, May 14th, 2024. The ordinance will be placed on the voting machines under the following heading. The dollar value of said questions shall be subject to the change based on the amendments from the floor of the annual town meeting. Those voters approving the question will vote yes, and those opposing the question will vote no. Those voting no will have an additional advisory question, is the budget too high or is the budget too low? Number one, shall the general government budget for the town of Killingly, Connecticut in the amount of 24,535,618 for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2025 be approved? Number two, shall the education budget for the town of Killingly, Connecticut in the amount of 47,508,839 for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2025 be approved? Voting will be held at the following polling places. District 1, 3, and 5, Board of Ed Central Office, 79 Westfield Ave in the cafeteria, Killingly, and District 2 and 4, Killingly High School, right here at 226 Putnam Pipe, Killingly, Connecticut. Absentee ballots will be available on the afternoon of May 7, 2024. Please contact the town clerk at 860-779-5307 as soon as possible. All ballots must be issued in person according to the Connecticut General Statutes. Kinley Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman. I now would like to open floor for nominations for the moderator. I nominate Jason Anderson as the moderator. Are there any more nominations? Are there any more nominations? Are there any more nominations? I'd like to make a motion to close nominations if there's no more. I'll make that motion. Sorry, say it again. I'll second. second it. All those in favor? All those opposed? I now would like to turn the meeting over to Jason Anderson as the moderator of the annual town meeting. Close. You did the vote for the close. Oh. Call the, call the vote for the moderator. Oh, okay. Uh, vote for Jason. <laughs> all those uh, approved? All those, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Jason. Thank you. Thank you. So this evening, those eligible to vote at town meeting are registered voters who are U.S. citizens and are at least 18 years of age. Those residents who are not registered voters are eligible to vote if they own property assessed at $1,000 or more on the grand list as of October 1st, 2023. 
These eligible voters will have the opportunity to speak or vote on the proposed town and school budgets. Eligible voters may make motions to modify the budgets presented. For the general government budget, you must specify a line item you want increased or decreased with a dollar amount. Whereas with the Board of Education, you can only suggest an increase or decrease in the proposed budget, give a dollar amount, but cannot specify where to increase or decrease the bottom line amount. I will entertain a motion uh, to limit everyone's comments and discussion to five minutes uh, per item. I'll make that motion. I'll make that motion to limit public comment to five minutes. I'll second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. At this time, um, Um, at this time, I will entertain a motion to adopt the ordinance approving the operating budgets for the Town of Killingly for the fiscal year July 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2025, as read by the Town Clerk. So moved. Second. Motion was made by Ms. Wakefield, second by Ms. Cretula. Uh, discussion? So we don't call the vote. This is an agenda to prevent okay. communication. And all right, at this time we'll move on and we will have the town manager do a presentation on the general government budget followed by the Board of Education presentation. Excuse me, Jason. Can we make sure that everybody is in? Because I don't think everybody expected to have to sign in. Just make sure there's nobody else out there that would want to be involved in this. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So um, as they're checking um, that, just as our, you know, just so you can all uh, be familiar, I don't know, um, some people may never have attended any annual town meeting. So at this point, all of you are participants as long as you're eligible voters, um, as, J as uh, Jason indicated in that outline. Um, I am gonna give a presentation to go over the town side of the operating budget. Um, and those components. And then after my presentation, the superintendent will give a presentation about the Board of Education before we move on to further discussion. Because now that you have a motion on the floor, you'll be able to start um, discussing that after we get through these presentations. I just want to make sure that we have everybody in the room. How are we? Okay, good. So it looks like we have everyone present um, that was waiting in line. So again, thank you everyone for coming. I'm Mary Clorio. I'm the town manager for the town. And I will be presenting to you tonight the town council's proposed budget. Um, so if you can go to the first slide. So um, the town council creates um, goals um, each time a, count, a new council is seated. Um, what I have here is the list of goals from this current council. Um, and so as we go through the budget process, we are looking to um, how can we uh, achieve those goals or progress through those goals um, when we're developing the budget. Many of these goals are very similar to the previous goals that were set two years ago by the, by the council as well. So um, we keep that in mind on the town side as we're going through that budgetary process. Next slide. Um, the next slide goes over on the town side, what is the budget development process? So um, on the town side in January, our department heads um, start developing their budgets. They review um, what their expenditures are. They have live actual expenditures for, 12, for um, six months and they have um, five years of prior expenditures for each line item. Um, we do scrutinize every line item, so like for dues and memberships, training, office supplies, they have to really go through and determine what are they, what are they expending it on and what are they projecting they're going to need to expend in the, in the subsequent year. That um, can be called zero-based budgeting where basically we um, 
we start out as zero and everybody builds back in what is actually needed and we look at all of that um, uh, prior spending and determine if there's more efficient ways to doing that. Um, in February, I meet with all of the department heads and review all of their budgetary requests. Um, and uh, when I'm evaluating that, I'm looking at, you know, obviously I'm keeping in mind any direction that I've gotten from the council um, in, you know, where they're hoping to be able to um, come in for their budget, but um, also keeping in mind those goals. By charter, on March 15th, the Board of Education submits their budget um, to the town manager's office. And then this year, on March 26th, the manager's budget, the town manager's budget, was um, delivered to the town council. And we started presentations on that because of the way Easter fell. We started the following week, the first week in April. So April 6th, that Saturday, I sat with the council for the entire day and reviewed all of the page by page, all of the um, town manager's budget on the town side. On April 11th, the town council held a public hearing on the town manager's budget. They had not yet deliberated. They had not yet made any determinations on the budget that I presented them. They were looking for feedback from the community on that, which they did receive feedback. And then on April 16th, the town council deliberated based on that feedback and um, in their review of the budget and in our conversations, they deliberated on that budget, on the town manager's budget. The council ultimately unanimously voted and set the budget that's before you tonight as the town council's budget. So this is their budget that they're presenting tonight. Um, and that's what comes to you as an annual town meeting. That's the same process that we follow every year. Um, so tonight is the annual town meeting, and then this annual town meeting adjourns to an all-day machine vote, which will be held next Tuesday on the 14th. Next slide. So really, we're going to start with the, the base, uh, kind of the, the ground level of what creates our mill rate, and that is our grand list. Um, this is a 10-year historical review of our grand list, and you'll note that the orange columns are the years in which we've had revaluation. The state requires every municipality to, per, to perform a revaluation every five years. That is because the town, um, and I'll go over what a revaluation is, but as you can see, the grand list, the value of the grand list grew in this most recent um, revaluation. So the next slide, what is revaluation? Again, this is a state law that mandates that we do a uh, revaluation every five years. Um, the ta the, in the state of Connecticut, property taxes are based on an ad valorem tax, which means it's based on market value. And as we all know, market values change differently over time for different types of properties. And the market fluctuates. So during this revaluation process, um, they are the, the revaluation company that we hired um, in any town is required to follow these specific standards when they're performing that revaluation. Next slide. So the grand list breakdown for October 1st of 2023, this is just the categories of the grand list. So 54% of the grand list is made up of residential real estate, commercial and industrial real estate, is 25% uh, and personal property is 13%. And so that's really indicating largely your uh, commercial uh, business base is between that commercial industrial and personal property. Motor vehicle is 7% and then we have other land which is largely vacant land, which is 1%. So when we have um, revaluate, this is the historical review view of mill rate changes and this does include the proposed mill rate that is before you tonight um, for this proposed budget. The, again, the, green, the orange bars indicate years in which we had revaluation. So if you go back to the grand list chart, you can see the grand list grew in those orange years, so it increased, so the mill rate decreased, right? The value of the grand list as it goes up, your mill rate, the, the amount that the town has to um, achieve in property taxes lowers because the valuation is higher. Next. <clears throat> so the next two slides are really overviews of the various categories that are comprising this entire budget. The first one is general government. The first line is town operations. 
The budget that's proposed before you is actually a decrease from the current year budget of just over $31,000. The human services category is our outside agency asks, and I'll go through some of what those increases are, but those are outside agencies that we either have to pay a per capita or there is a um, statutory requirement or there are an outside agency requested looking for funding. That does have an increase of 133. Solid waste subsidy, the town, the general government budget has been subsidizing our solid waste fund for the operations of our transfer station for, um, I think, forever, for a very long time. Um, that subsidy is being reduced because the Solid Waste Subcommittee did look at increasing fees for the use of the transfer station, so that is gonna be made up by people that are actively utilizing the transfer station. Their fees are gonna be increasing in order to use that. Um, debt service has an increase, and that is because we are issuing debt as we projected when we passed the approvals for the KMS project and the Westfield Avenue renovation project. We knew that we were gonna have to bring on debt for those. This is the, the first, the second round of debt issuances that we had pro, uh, projected in that. So that's an increase on the debt service. The student transportation CNR, that is uh, the reserve account that we have for student transportation. Um, and that has a decrease and that's just generally because of um, the size vehicles that were purchased over time um, has uh, lessened that burden. So overall on the town general government budget side, um, we have um, a total increase uh, including, and largely that's made up of the debt service of $431,000, um, which does have a decrease from in mill rate um, from the prior, prior year. Capital projects I broke out separately. In the current year, capital projects, the town council and the town had authorized replacement of the town of the library roof and uh, road renewals. Um, for the upcoming year, for 2024-25, the only projected capital outlay is for road renewal, for road projects. So the town is maintaining the same level funding for that in the, in the budget that's before you. And so that has no impact on mill rate because we're, good, we're utilizing fund balance for that um, to offset any capital investment. And that has been something that the town has been very cautious in is utilizing fund balance for capital outlay items because as we're going through our debt service, just as anybody would go through for your, say if you were refinancing your mortgage, um, the, your credit rating agencies look at if you're using your savings for one-time expenditures like a capital outlay, or if you're using it to pay your day-to-day -day operational costs, the credit rating agencies are um, amenable or they don't, we don't end up getting a d uh, decrease in our credit rating, which costs money to the town. Um, if we use it for capital investment, if we were to use it for operational to offset our everyday operational costs, the credit rating agencies get concerned around that. So um, we've been using it for capital projects. Um, the next page, the first part is uh, education. I will let the superintendent cover those. And so that comes to a combined um, tax requirement and a combined mill rate of 21.18. So the next slide goes over just on a high level, the overall revenues from the budget. So this, you can see 55% of our revenue is from property taxes. Um, you really should include that Lake Road generating. Lake Road is actually assessed based on an assessed value, just like everybody here in the room is. So that is property taxes, but we've always broken that out separately on here so, because it is such a large impact to the community. So um, they are at 8%. Education is 25%, and that largely is our educational cost-sharing grant that we get from the state. Um, that is largely what is the largest component of that 25%. And then you can see the other smaller groupings of revenues that we receive to offset the expenditures. Next slide. Our overall expenditures, and this again is at that high level, so the total expenditures, you can see that the largest portion of the overall expenditures is the Board of Education at just about 66%. Um, town operations is just about 19%. 
uh, debt service is uh, just under 8%, and then you can see the other uh, smaller percentages of the other categories. So when we look at town operations, that's really what I've been uh, focused on is town operations proposal. This is the expenditures in their categories, and as you can see, the largest component is public works, um, and that incorporates um, not just uh, highway, it also incorporates our central garage, which does our full fleet management, um, storm maintenance uh, and response. The other sections that we have are general government at 16%, and that is what I would consider here, think about everything that's in the town hall, so the town clerks, the assessors, the finance department, engineer, um, not engineering, um, community development, uh, those are all in general government. Recreation and culture is our library, our parks and our parks, our recreation. Those are all in cultural and recreation. Public health and safety and uh, community development, 15%. That is our uh, building department, our law enforcement and community development is in there. And then you can see that we have uh, the human services subsidies. Those are our outside agencies that we spoke about before. Um, employee benefits and insurance, that covers all employees from every category. And then we do have some special reserves. Next. So as the town manager's budget, I presented to the town council, these were the changes that I had presented to the town council. They have made modifications from this, but initially the drivers for change on the town's um, operations was clearly we have contractual services increases based on our union contracts. We have impact from minimum wage. The proposal that I have before the town council and that they have uh, continued, they have, um, continued in the proposal in the budget before you is moving a parks seasonal position to a full-time parks position um, a year-round position so we have we've continued to increase our outdoor active recreation space um, if anybody's been down on the river trail we're in the construction phase of phase five of the river trail that will be um, further expanding the river trail south um, that is all ground that needs to be ma managed and maintained. Right now we only have two full-time parks staff that manage that throughout the entire winter and many people utilize our, rec our um, trails during the winter months um, for you know walking and stuff like that. They're the ones that um, plow them, make sure that they're passable, um, make sure the trash is taken out, all of that. Um, they also manage all of the parking lots and all of the sidewalks that are adjacent to town buildings. So there's a lot that um, our park staff does throughout the winter. And they also work on parks projects as weather permits throughout the winter. And as you know, we've had some good winters where we've been able to get some additional work done on some of our parks um, infrastructure. Um, so that's the proposal that's before you. Um, and that also does mean that there was an increase in health insurance basically for that additional parks position, which currently right now as a seasonal is not eligible for health insurance. Um, debt service was the biggest driver um, to the increase in the town's budget at the 802,000. And then I had had an additional request for increased capital investment in roads. That was ultimately removed by the town council. So we'll go over um, the other component for human subsidy, I had indicated in the first page that we had an increase of about 133,000 in um, human services subsidies. And this is an outline of exactly what's driving that. So there's an increase by NDDH. The paramedic intercept service, that's a regional contract and the costs for that have increased, the per call costs have increased on that. 911 dispatch is a per capita and per call basis, and that has an increase. Um, the elderly nutrition program is a per capita cost. Um, KB Ambulance had an increased request, a um, $60,000 increased request, and then we had a new agency that requested funding. UCFS Healthcare had requested funding. Ultimately, <clears throat> the town council's budget, these are the changes that the town council made. So <clears throat> first, they, um, the town has had um, a, bud, a, a department budget called winter maintenance. Um, and it was only used for exactly that, just winter. So when it was 
when, the, when there was snow or freezing precipitation out there, that's the only time that we could charge costs to that. But as you know, we have a lot of storms that occur that require highway or road maintenance that we're, it's not that it's freezing outside, it's that we've had wind events. Um, so we had, the town had developed a reserve fund quite, quite, quite a few years ago to save up for those unforeseen storm weather related events. So by doing so, we're able to reduce the regular highway budget by overtime because now that's all gonna go into storm maintenance um, budget. And then also, we're reducing the storm maintenance over timeline by 40,000 because they now have a reserve. So the reserve is about a little over $300,000. So if there really is a really bad winter or a really bad event, there is, there is um, a buffer for that. And I will say that our credit rating agencies have been um, very supportive and very um, uh, uh, encouraging to um, the town for maintaining these long-term um, views and long-term commitments um, and kind of planning for that future. Um, so the other piece that they reduced was the salt maintenance um, from the storm maintenance account by 43,000. Because again, we have the reserve, so if there's a really heavy winter, we are gonna be going into next winter with a full salt shed. So they felt comfortable in backing down what that expenditure was in the regular operating budget to sub provide some relief to the community. Um, the next cut that was uh, done was uh, in our central garage. We are budgeted currently for three mechanics positions. We have had one mechanics positions vacant for more than a year. Um, we just have not been able to fill that position. Um, and we have not seen any uh, detriments around uh, maintaining our fleet. Our two mechanics that we have, they're stellar mechanics, um, and they've been able to still manage all of those components. So we are, the town council has removed that third mechanic position along with the benefits associated with that. The other cuts that the town council made was with regards to human services subsidy. They, um, they reduced some of the subsidy for the Killingly Business Association. Um, in the prior years, the count town had been funding it at $3,000. Last year, they asked for a bump up to $5,000. They're bringing it back down to the $3,000 level. Um, they reduced KB Ambulance by 5,000 based on fuel, um, and uh, in reviewing that with KB Ambulance, uh, they had assumed an increase in fuel costs for next year. The town has locked in our fuel costs for next year, and we actually have a decrease in costs, so that was an alleviated, that was, they were able to alleviate that pr cost out of KB Ambulance. And then lastly, the UCFS, which was a new request from a new outside agency, the town council did not support that request, so they've removed that funding for that outside agency. Um, as I indicated before, the pavement management, my original, the town manager's original proposal had an increase of a million dollars in road pavement management. Um, this brings it back to the same level. Again, there's no impact to mill rate on that because that was directly offset by um, uh, fund balance. And then the Board of Education, the town council reduced their um, request by the 700, little over 703,000. So that brought the town council's proposed mill rate at 21.18. Next. So what the heck does this mean to my taxes, right? Um, because this was a revaluation year, everybody's properties changed at different rates. So you really need to look up your property value from what it was previously to what it currently is as of the October 1st, 2023 grand list and do the calculation. I have links on here. There is, um, there are links on the website that you can do that calculation and there is a calculator on there. But as you can see from this, I picked five random uh, residential properties to do the calculation on. So they're not tied to anybody or anything. They are tied to people because they are actual grand lists. They, I went and picked parcels off of the map. But as you can see, there are some people that at 21.18, they will have a decrease in their property taxes. Um, others will have an increase and it all depends on how much your property value changed from your October 1st, 2022 grand list 
to the new revaluation one. So I encourage everyone to do that calculation for themselves. Your calculation may not end up being the same as your neighbor. So go and do that calculation. If you're, if you, if you're having a hard time getting that calculation or find, trying to identify where to get the numbers from, call my office. We'll gladly walk you through how to find that information on the website. Um, I know that there's been concern that there's been a big shift to residential and that residential properties are going to be increasing or taking a larger portion of the property taxes. So I also did commercial and industrial to really look at, as a sampling again, five commercial industrial properties. Um, some are small businesses, some are larger um, industrial to see what their impact is. And as you can see, there are some that have decreases and there are some that have increases. Again, it all depends on what that value is. And this for the commercial industrial is only looking at their real estate. Um, I was comparing just real estate to real estate. So again, on the resources, um, there's the links. Um, go on our front page of our website. It has um, the propose, a link to the proposed budgets and it has all of these links on here for you to be able to um, do that calculation for you independent for yourself um, with how that works for your own property. So um, the other, so I, I thank you all for that, um, for being here tonight and for letting me give you that presentation of the town council's budget. At this time, um, we will turn over to the superintendent for the presentation of the Board of Education budget. Uh, before we start with that, I would just like to remind everyone who's in the audience, if you came in and you are a registered voter or own personal property worth $1,000 or more as of October 1st, 2023, in order to be able to vote today or make motions from the floor, you had to have seen the register voters out front and gotten a pink card like this pink or green, pink, or green. Um, pink for registered voters green for property owners who are not registered voters um, anyone who did not get one of these is not going to be able to vote so if you are a property owner um, or a registered voter and you did not get a card yet go out to the front desk thank you miss nash all set all right Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sue Nash, Superintendent for Killingly Public Schools. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, so today, uh, we're gonna go through a journey of our budget and all the important events that have led up to tonight. My goal is to educate the community on how the budget evolves from October all the way to May. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I was the assistant superintendent for two years prior to becoming the superintendent for this school year. And I had the unique opportunity of sitting on the sidelines while I watched other budget presentations happen. And while I was on the sidelines, I took careful notes of what made community members feel uncomfortable about the budget and what brings people together around the budget. And so tonight, I will intentionally address what I have seen in the past to make community members feel uncomfortable so that you can leave tonight fully understanding the decisions that have been made around the budget and the implications for those decisions. So tonight is really about education. And I start with this slide. This figure of nearly $1 million from the COVID relief grant funding that we have used for several positions over several years. Uh, I thought this was an important backdrop um, because it kind of cast a different light on how we budgeted this year. For the last three years, we have had significant grant funding from COVID relief grants. And at the beginning of this school year, this number on the screen uh, was funding salaries for multiple positions um, that we've had for many different years. And when the grants go away, which by the way, will be in September, this next September, all the positions will go away as well. Uh, and it was forecasted that the 24-25 budget would be the fiscal cliff, not just here in Killingly, 
but for all school districts that received COVID funds, which was really all school districts. So we had to be creative as we built this year's budget um, to preserve some of those positions while keeping the budget responsible. All right, so let's dive in. In the fall, I introduced to my administrative team zero-based budgeting. So that was new um, for the administrative team. And what is zero-based budgeting? It's really what it sounds like, right? So you build your budget from zero, one justified line by one justified line. And we made this decision because some, sometimes you just have to clear it all out to make sure that what you're adding back into your budget is supporting your educational goals and you don't have any overlap or redundancy. And it was a long and tedious process for sure, um, but we were able to reduce nearly all of our budget lines with the exception of salaries. So it was a strategy that worked well. So after building the budget line by line and taking into consideration salaries, we had a preliminary budget of 49137943 or 4.98 increase. Clearly too high. Back to the drawing boards. So in February, I asked the administrators to reduce their budget by 15%. We moved some of our um, uh, expenses for summer school into a grant and came up with a total reduction of 483000 and that brought the budget down to 4.05% increase. And that was actually the uh, budget that I presented to the Board of Education as the superintendent's budget. But we knew that was still too high. So what we did in March um, was that we went through our existing budget. So the budget that we have right now, right? And we saw if we could recognize some um, surplus funds. So sometimes during a budget cycle, there is unexpended funds. And a lot of times you notice that in our salary and benefit lines. Why does this happen? Well, you don't always fill all of your positions. Sometimes uh, there is a position that lays vacant for a period of time. Sometimes someone is hired and they don't take the benefits. So you have some savings there. And so we recognize all those savings. We also recognize some savings in utilities. So we've moved to solar panels and natural gas, and we're starting to see a pattern of savings there. And so <clears throat> we were able to do some pre-spending. And what does that mean? Pre-spending means that you will uh, purchase things in your next year's budget, so the 24-25 budget, using the funds from the current year's budget. <coughs> and so, Oh, I should go back one. So then <coughs> we adopted the, I should say, the Board of Education unanimously adopted uh, a budget of 48,212,561 or 3.01% increase. And that would be a mill rate increase of 0.78. And so after the Board of Ed adopts a budget, it's sent to the town council for deliberation. And this year after that deliberation, the town council requested that the Board of Ed reduce their budget by about $703,000. This would bring the budget down to a 1.5% increase and a mill rate increase of 0.38. And so the last part of this journey is right now. Um, there, what we have to recognize what we will cut from the Board of Education budget to reduce um, about 703,000. So let's go through some of that. There are several ways to reduce a budget. Some come with no risk, some come with slight risk. And so re to reduce the Board of Education's budget by 703,000, we did a mix of both. Let's go through the low risk strategies first. So hiring at a lower step or benefits not taken. This first strategy is similar to what I just said. So at th this time in the spring, you might know your vacancies for next year. Some people have put in their retirement letters, some people have resigned, and so you already have some known vacancies for next year. We start those interview process processes to fill those positions now. And so we may hire a, an educator who is at a lower step 
or maybe that person doesn't take benefits. And so depending on who that person is filling for, there might be some savings. You may wonder how much savings can happen in this scenario. It actually can be significant. So in this scenario, you have a teacher of 30 years making $87,000 with a family benefits package of $19,000. That person retires. Teacher B fills that slot with zero years experience and doesn't take the benefits package. So you can see the savings is over $50,000 and that's just in one scenario. It should be noted that this can also work in the opposite direction too. So if you have someone who is at a lower step and resigns and you hire someone at a higher step, it can also work in the opposite direction. But usually there's some savings there. And so we have found some savings just kind of naturally with that process. We've hired for science, guidance, world cultures, and art. Total savings, about $55,000 so far. Next, we have these two bullet points. A reduction or adjustments in position and elimination of positions. These are pretty straightforward, so let's just look at those right now. The first is reductions. So the IT department found a way to reduce their overall budget in equipment and ProTech, and we did adjust the uh, Killingly Intermediate School Library aid to, from a full-time position to a half-time position. So we were able to save $43,000 with that maneuver. And for elimination, we have two teachers, or had two teachers of the deaf. And um, earlier this year, one of those teachers resigned. And after a careful analysis of all of the students that we currently have that require services from a teacher of the deaf, we feel extremely confident that we can service those students sufficiently with the one teacher of the deaf that we currently have. So we will not need to fill this position. It should be noted that both of these are currently vacant positions. So that's a total savings of 113,000. Okay, one more low risk way to reduce the budget. And that's finding other funding sources. For, so for us, other funding sources usually come in the form of grants. And we were able to find some remaining grants where we could move portions of salaries or positions, such as paraprofessionals, and things like um, summer school into grants. We also were able to find a little more surplus funds from this current year budget to purchase supplies and equipment out of next year's budget. So a total savings of $97,000 found there. Okay, so now we get into some unchartered territory right here. Increase an estimated percent of excess cost reimbursement. If what I just said makes absolutely no sense, don't worry, because I'm gonna explain it. Okay, what is excess cost reimbursement? Well, it's a grant that's provided um, from the state and it's money that is given to the school districts to assist in paying for special education expenses for students with extraordinary needs. So we're only eligible for part of a student's tuition. Um, and let me just back up even further. So sometimes we have students that based on their needs, they require an out of district placement. And all of those placements require a tuition to be paid. That's where we can apply the excess cost reimbursement grant to part of that tuition. There is a pretty uh, tricky calculation to this. So I think it's best explained with an example. Okay, so student A, let's pretend their out of district placement tuition is $100,000. So how to figure out what is eligible for reimbursement? So if the per pupil expenditure for Killingly, we know is $18,794, you multiply that by four and a half times. That's the algorithm that the state has districts do to figure out what's eligible. That comes out to 84,573. 
that money, the Board of Edu Education is responsible to pay for tuition for student A. But remember, student A's tuition is $100,000. So we subtract 84,000 from the 100,000 and we get about $15,000. So that part is eligible. But only a portion of that is eligible to receive excess cost reimbursement. This year, we received 71% reimbursement. That is always fluctuating. So some years we might get higher than 71% reimbursement. Other years we'll get lower than 71% reimbursement. And we don't always know, in fact, we don't know, what that number is until the spring of the year that you're going to use it. So we just found out a few weeks ago that we're getting 71% reimbursement. So it's a bit of a moving target when you're trying to figure out how to you know, budget for your special education costs because you know you're going to get something, you're just not entirely sure how much you're going to get. So in this case, 71% of 15,000 would be about 10,953. And that's what we would have reimbursed for student A's tuition. So twice a year, the town receives that excess cost reimbursement. And at the end of the year, the school district lets the town know how much we need to apply to the debt that we have accrued in special education tuition. So for most of the year, we are running in a deficit for special education tuition because we know we will be getting the excess cost reimbursement. We're just not entirely sure how much. So we had originally budgeted conservatively at 60% reimbursement, and we have moved up to 70% reimbursement. That would uh, that adjustment there would reduce two hundred and five thousand from our budget. Okay, one more way to reduce, and that is using the non-lapsing fund for potential agency place special education tuition overages. That again might sound a little bit complicated, so let's unpack that. Um, so first of all, let's unpack, unpack what is agency placed. So if you have a student um, that is agency placed, usually that means DCF has placed a student in an outplacement type of setting, and we have to pay the tuition for that student. So we don't really have much of a say, we just have to pay that tuition, and we budget for that to happen. Now it should be known that not every year does that scenario happen, although there have been some years where we have not even had enough to pay for that scenario because it has happened with a couple of students. So again, a slight risk here because you're never entirely sure if that scenario is going to happen. If DCF is going to place one student, two students, maybe only for part of the year, you don't know. So we will be using our non-lapsing fund to um, support any agency place tuitions should there be some next year. Again, you're never entirely sure that scenario will happen. It has happened in the past. It hasn't always happened. So, something that I know that has made people uncomfortable is the non-lapsing. And I think it's just because not everyone really understands its origin and its intent. So I made a little bit of a timeline here. I dug deep into the folder of non-lapsing and did a historical review. And so hopefully this brings some clarity to what the non-lapsing account is all about. So in 2016, this is when it was born, the town council authorized the town manager to create a non-lapsing fund. And at the time, the cap of the non-lapsing was $1 million. And the contributions could not exceed 1% of the overall budget. This was actually a statute that was born in 2010. And right around this time is when many 
towns and schools created this non-lapsing fund. Then there was an increase to the cap in 2019. So the town council approved an increase to the cap, bringing it up to 1.75 million. And then in 2020, there was an adjustment to the statute, which said that now you could contribute, di school districts could contribute 2% of their overall budget. And so the town council approved that, and they also approved raising the cap to 2 million. And then most recently, this April, the town council did not approve the Board of Education's request to contribute 411,000 to bring the non-lapsing account back up to the 2 million cap. Rather, they approved to send to public hearing and special town meeting, that's on June 4th, to add 161,463 to the non-lapsing, and this would fill the balance to 1.75 million. So, I can imagine that some people might be concerned about using the non-lapsing for potential special education tuition because we have typically used the non-lapsing for capital projects. So that's just something we need to be mindful of. So when the facility subcommittee meets and we have projects that we have um, in the queue that we would like to do, we have to just be cognizant that we may need to use that non-lapsing for our special education tuition. So it's just something that we need to keep in the back of our mind. And so doing that uh, adjustment for agency place students, there would be a recognized savings of $190,000. Okay, so let's recap all of those reductions. Hiring at lower steps, reductions, elimination of one uh, position, which is a vacancy, finding other funding sources, also agency place student tuition zeroing out that line, and then uh, using uh, or bumping up the excess cost reimbursement es estimate from 60 to 70 percent. If you've added all that up in your head, it comes to 703,722, which is what we have been asked to reduce. What does that look like? This is what it looks like. So this was the Board of Education's adopted budget on the left, and on the right is what the town council uh, reduction looks like when applied to that budget. So 47,508,839, or 1.5% increase, and 0.39% increase on the mill rate. So moving forward for the remainder of this presentation, I will be using the budget that the town council um, has reduced. So that's what I'll use for the base for all the remaining calculations. <coughs> and here are some of those calculations. So if you look at the percent increase on the different lines that we have in our budget, you can see that uh, overwhelmingly salaries has the largest increase. So 132% increase. Many of those are contracted obligations. So not every employee that we have in Killing Public Schools is um, part of a bargaining unit, but many are. So there's very little that we can do with that line, except for cutting positions or eliminating them altogether. You can see that most of our other lines, we have found savings. So benefits came in a little bit lower. And our utilities, I had mentioned before, with gas and solar, we're starting to see a nice pattern there. Supplies and equipment, to be completely transparent, like I mentioned before, we did do some pre-spending. Nearly $700,000 of pre-spending from surplus in this year's budget, taking out of next year's budget. So that's why you can see that savings there. Another way to look at this is the budget as a whole, and you can see the percentage that each part makes up in the budget. Again, just another way to look at this, right? And you can see that all the other pieces of the budget, less salaries, are very small. Salaries and benefits make up a significant part of the budget. Another aspect of our budget is our revenue. So we do generate some revenue, 18 million um, thereabouts. 
and we, we receive grant funding for our agricultural program. We also have about 62 tuition-paying students that come to this high school, and we have an education cost-sharing um, grant that we receive. And so you can see, if looking at the 24, 25, 47 million, taking away the 18 million of revenue, you kind of have a net there of 29 million. And here is a historical view, although part of that got cut off a little bit. Um, hopefully you have that in front of you. So the historical view, you can kind of see how the superintendent's budget moves through the Board of Education budget and then the adopted budget. Okay, let's address the elephant in the room. How much money will the Board of Ed give back to the town? Because that is always least from my vantage point, a very contentious issue in the past few years. So um, let's just uh, bring that right out right now and talk about it. Um, so to be clear, um, school districts should always have some surplus. It would be very irresponsible not to have some surplus at any given time in the school year because the opposite of surplus is deficit and we don't want to be running in a deficit. Um, and I would say that of 25 years of education, every district that I've worked in has had some surplus at the end of the school year. Um, typically what happens at the end of the school year, um, districts will do some pre-spending like we have done. Um, if they have a larger amount of surplus, sometimes there's a capital project that will be done or something larger, maybe you know, like new furniture in a school, I've seen that happen before. And you might wonder why we have a surplus at all. Um, why can't we just kind of forecast what we need and spend it? But unfortunately, when you deal with humans, um, it doesn't always work out that neatly. So here are the main examples of why we have a surplus. One, I had mentioned before, unfilled positions and benefits not taken. There could be breaks in service. Someone starts the year, leaves for a few months, and then the position is filled. But there's a break in service there. Hiring replacement positions at lower steps. I had mentioned that before. New hires not taking benefits. That happens too. Sometimes we have long-term substitutes filling positions. Substitutes are paid significantly less than certified teachers. And lastly, if we're not able or we do not need to use all of the excess cost reimbursement for special education tuition, then we do return that back to the town. As of this morning, we have spent 80% of our budget. We have two months left for payroll and expenses. We have five unfilled positions for this school year, and we are projected to use nearly all of our excess cost reimbursement this year. So the answer, what the elephant is asking is we will not be returning large amounts of money to the town as we have in the past. I do not know exactly how much we were returning because we still have expenses, but we would like to return enough to bring the non-lapsing account back up to its cap. That would be the goal. So I'll end with this slide. We are proud of the experiences our students receive in Killingly Public Schools. Those experiences are made possible by our dedicated staff. All of our staff play a role in this experience and we will not impact our students' experiences. So the slight risk that we used with some of the maneuvers we made to reduce our overall budget is certainly worth preserving our students' experiences. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thank you very much. At this time, um, we will call for discussion on a general government budget for fiscal year July 1st, 24 to June 30th, 2025. Um, anyone who would like to make comments uh, or motions, state your name and address for the record. And those who are making motions, um, we will need a second to a motion. Uh, whoever seconds it will also have to state their name and address for the record. So at this time, anyone who would like to speak to the town government, please step up to the microphone. Uh, 
Hi, um, Thomas Howard, uh, Chestnut Hill Road. Uh, my wife and I have been uh, homeowners in the town of Tony since 79. And this is gonna be our eighth uh, reevaluation. And uh, through the years, keeping track of the uh, increases uh, in both the, uh, uh, the taxes and the uh, reassessments, this is the largest I have ever seen. And it's scary. Uh, our, our, our home was uh, recessed for 74% increase. This is just the standard four-bedroom home. We've not done any great, uh, we haven't done any re, uh, uh, additions to the home. It's the same it was when we built it in uh, uh, 2000. And uh, it's, it's just amazing that uh, my, my tax, if, if this uh, budget is passed, our taxes are going up $1,700. I'm a retired uh, man with a fixed income, and I just fall just, be, uh, just above the uh, uh, elderly or uh, anyone over 65 to get a reduction. And uh, it's just amazing that over the years, my taxes are increased 37%. Um, I encourage everyone to vote to get uh, the budgets reduced even further. It's not going to make too much difference uh, with me. Um, if uh, someone can answer a question, do you know what the average uh, assessment in the town of Killingly is, I was told uh, by the town of Killingly when I called today, uh, the uh, assessor's office, that it was about 35% is the average increase. A lot of people below, and I'm 74%. That's astronomical. Is it, can anyone answer that? So yeah, this is Mary Gloria, the town manager. Um, for residential real estate, mm -hmm. the um, average um, increase that we've seen on that bell curve for revaluation is uh, really closer to about 43 to 45%. Okay. Um, but we, mm -hmm. I will say that we did see um, the information that we got from the revaluation company with regards to the you know, housing market. Um, three and four bedroom homes saw the highest pressure in the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, during during this time, so we they those style properties, those style houses, did see the greatest change in their valuation because of market pressures, and so those have been the most sought after properties. Yeah, it's I've never seen it this way. I know. Um, I, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I can. Uh, um, but in January, ask for uh, a consideration in the assess uh, a reassociation of uh, of my property, uh, the reevaluation. Is that pro uh, is that true? So uh, you would apply to the board of assessment appeals, mm -hmm. um, and you could do that uh, really next uh, January, next January, early February, to apply yep. for them to evaluate. Um, your assessment um, mm -hmm. at that point in time, but yes, the current for the current up for the upcoming budget year, the process for the board of assessment appeals is ended, but you'll be able right. to do it for the subsequent cycle. Yeah, if I had known, um, I would have I, I would have asked in January. But like I said, this is my eighth reevaluation, and I have never seen it come up this high, whereas the uh, mill rate would go down low enough to make the difference. Uh, small increases is fine, you know, but I mean, $1,700 is a lot. But, and, uh, sir, you may also want, um, I didn't catch age or anything, but um, at age 70 and over, you may be, el may be eligible for the elderly freeze program, which again mm -hmm. would freeze your assessment, so then you mm -hmm. wouldn't have that those fluctuation and changes. But again, I would encourage mm -hmm. you to look into those 
Um, those links are on our website for anybody else that is interested. Mm -hmm. Go to the assessor's page um, or call the assessor's office. We can walk you through those as well. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, reliant on income though, right? That is true, yes. That's but again, right. that's why I say you may be eligible. Right. I'm just Look over the up. limit uh, according to what Connie said today. Uh, I'm just over the limit and uh, wow. Okay, maybe that'll uh, increase over the years. I don't know. <laughs> because I am 70 now, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claudette Rogers. I live on Putnam Pike. I've been a town resident for 45 years. I've been part of the Conservation Commission for a year. Um, I'm coming here tonight to request that the $1,000 that we were given last year as a budget be put back into the budget. Um, I heard that it was getting knocked down from 3,000 to 2,000. And um, me as a taxpayer know that I, my one household pays well over $3,000 for a year. And I think that Donna does a great job of we are a bunch of volunteers that get people out there into the public and we, there is no cost to us in our um, services that we provide for the town and I really enjoy the residents of the town being able to see what the town has been and um, the different conservation areas we're trying to do new age stuff like geocaching and stuff like that to get the more of the school age kids out there and you know we have a good following so i am proposing that the thousand dollars that got cut from the conservation budget be put back in okay i just want to clarify for everyone in the room so that's a motion to increase the conservation commission line item by a thousand dollars Donna, say your name and address. Donna Brownwell, 699 Bailey Hill Road, East Kilogram. Light item 5264. So um, I just want to provide some uh, information around that because um, that actually was, uh, I had made that reduction in the town manager's side of the budget. Um, so the Conservation Commission, they do a lot of really great work throughout the, throughout the community, throughout the, the years. The number that is being presented to the town right now um, in, the, in the budget um, was based on what their historical spend has been plus an additional $500 because they were looking at doing some additional bus trips. Um, that was reduced, um, so we reduced the budgetary amount for the from the current fiscal year by $1,000 from $3,000 down to $2,000 anything additional that hadn't been spent. So if you're looking at the budget, the, the detail, you're gonna say that budget was spent every single year. Actually, the portion that the commission had not spent at the end of the year got transferred into open space. So it looks like it's spent every year, but it actually got transferred into open space land acquisition fund. It's a separate fund. Um, so that was really what that, um, the drivers were around why that change was made, was we were looking at, the, at the, what the commission was actually expending every year. And we did incorporate some additional funds um, in that calculation to recognize that they were looking, they were talking about doing additional bus trips. So we did incorporate an additional 500 from what their previous last few years expenditures had been. Um, the motion and second that you have on the floor for the additional $1,000, if that is approved tonight, that will not change the mill rate. Um, it, that's, that won't have an impact on the mill rate calc on the mill rate that is before you. That would it would remain at twenty one point one eight. Who moved the question? At this time, the question has been moved. All those in favor, raise your card. Okay. 
All those opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Hello, Cal Buckley, 150 Lum Street in Downson. I have several questions. Valuation of the house and all that. I look at it this way. I went out for a hamburger, it was $18, so I expect things to go up. So I just don't eat hamburger no more and I don't go out, so I can expect that. And during the evaluation time, I didn't mow my lawn. I was hoping to go low that way. As far as uh, the town council goes, I love it. It's really great goals. But you know what kind of coffee you're going to have? That's it. So anyways, I was looking at, I didn't hear nothing about the town council program and the budget and all that. What are we looking for? to improve on the town council, I mean, uh, the constable program, yeah. What are we looking for? Why do, what money do we need? I see the, I see them patrolling. I noticed they got a building. What do we need more from them? Why they're raising the budget for them? So the incre they, there is no increase in the budget for okay. law enforcement. Um, we have kept the same number of positions um, in the budget. So it, it, that is really kind of keeping this as a pause year, if you will, on the goals. The initial goal for um, the law enforcement uh, program was to, do, to get to 10 constables and one resident state trooper. Um, this budget before you would have nine constables. Uh, we have we have eight currently. We are looking at getting one in one into um, the academy for the upcoming cycle, which would start in October. So, the budget before you doesn't have an increase in positions. Okay, thank you. Um, I was looking at the community center. I don't know how much money we spend on maintenance and rebuilding and things like that of the budget. Have we ever considered moving the community center? Yes, sir. So we're actually in the process of doing that. The town um, had approved the relocation, the renovation of the Westfield Avenue property. So the former high school to incorporate the community center into that, that would then, um, you know, take it out of the Broad Street facility, we would then uh, decommission and uh, likely dispose of the Broad Street facility or whatever the town decides to do at that time with that facility. Um, but we would incorporate the community center into Westfield Avenue, which is part of why the town is actually, why the budget before you does have an increase is because we are issuing the debt for that capital renovation to that building. That was my suggestion. That means the rec department goes over there? Uh, no, there's not enough room in that in that building. The, that building is uh, utilized also by the Board of Education for central for their central office. And EastCon has a uh, day program that they operate there. There's not enough room to move the law enforcement there, so law enforcement will remain at Soap Street. They'll be moving into that facility here shortly. Thank you. That was my one of my suggestions, anyways. And uh, the other one is for the education department. What does EastCon pay, contribute to Kilner Lake? Do we get rent from them? Do we, and where does it go into the budget? Sir, one thing uh, I will let you know, right now we're on the town government budget. Mm -hmm. um, questions to the Board of Ed, we will get to the Board of Education oh, okay. side after everyone's done speaking and making motions on the town side. Then let me all sit down. Thank you. Yep. Uh, good evening. Al Soper, 175 Cranberry Bog Road. Um, I've been, I was 
asked the assessor to give me the spreadsheet with all the reevaluations of what people paid in the past and what people paid in the future, and filtered out all the residential type properties, just residential types, because he has the commercial and everything else in there, and did some summarizing of how much, or the percentage of people whose taxes are going to be going up a lot versus a little bit versus not at all. And so only about 12% of the people, the residents in town, taxes go down. 46% of people's tax go up zero to 50, stay the same or 50. 27, almost 28% of people's taxes, just resident types only, go up 50 to $100 a month. I'm talking about a month. And almost 14% of, of the residents' taxes go up over $100 a month. And that's with the mill rate of 21.18. And so the cuts that, I mean, the budget is, is good. I, I like the way the budget is done, but we're going to have to make some deep cuts in order to offset, like the one gentleman whose tax has gone right up, who is on a fixed income. Even if we get the, the mill rate down to 20, for instance, my taxes go up from, because I fall into one of those resident, residents with four houses, mine went from $8,000 previous to the new mill rate of $9,400 to, if we go, even if it goes down to 20, my tax is still only going to be $8,800. So I'm still getting a $1,000 increase on my tax, even though the mill rate goes down to 20. So we're going to have to, um, you hate to say it, but there's going to be like a million dollars have to come out of our budget to get the mill rate down to 20 or thereabouts. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm a, you know, the taxes are going to go up, but someone like the gentleman said, that's really going to put a hurt on the fixed income people. I'm a senior citizen, but I'm not eligible and I still work. So I'm in a little bit better position than the retirees in, in our town. So my proposal is that, and I know you don't, it's been discussed before, is that we look at the, the general operating budget of cutting 500 million from that and cutting another 500 million from the road, from the road, not 500 million, 500,000, sorry, sorry about that. I even wrote M and scratched it out and put a K next to my numbers. 500,000 from the general operating budget and 500,000 from the, is it roads and the roads, is that the other, uh, so for the roads, um, yeah. that is fully offset by uh, fund balance contribution. So, so that's not being paid for by mill rate. Right, that's, but, but, is, but can that be cut? I mean, you, you talked about affecting your, um, your bond rating fund, you know, if we cut stuff that's in capital or in roads improvements, is that true? And how does, can... So the town, so in order to maintain our bonding rating, yeah. which basically drives how much we're paying in interest costs, yeah. Yeah. Um, the credit rating agencies look for towns to expend any uh, fund balance to capital projects. So if we were to reduce the, the, the road pavement projects, capital projects that are proposed in this budget, are fully offset by the using of fund balance. So it's not being, it's not impacting mill rate at all. But is it a possibility to, to use some of that money to offset the mill rate? Right, so if you were to, and that's the conversation that we've had with the town yeah. council many, many times, if the town chooses to, if the town council, count, the council is the one that activates the fund balance. If they utilize the fund balance for operating costs, then we will likely take a hit on our credit rating and it'll increase our, our interest rate costs because the credit rating agency views that as you're using your savings to pay your regular ongoing day-to-day -day costs and eventually that's not sustainable. Right, but you don't um, know how much or if that would happen. Um, I will say, based on our conversations that we just had a couple of weeks ago with the credit rating agency, I would say that that's a probably a, a very high probability that they would reduce our credit rating because of the pressures of the um, additional debt that we're taking on. Um, and they specifically asked about how we planned on, if we had any plans on utilizing fund balance. Mm -hmm. and. When we said capital, they were um, they were okay with that. They had concerns around operational use. Okay, so then I'll re revamp my proposal then, because I, I guess 
it's worse to affect the road paving than it is the capital budget. Is that a safe statement to say? Uh, the capital, the capital plan, which is the road pavement management plan, is fully funded by fund balance, so it doesn't impact mill rate. Oh, right. I understand that, but I'm trying to transfer money from one to another to help the poor the retirees in town who are going to get a $1,400, you know, for those type of properties. So. Right, so the, on the town meeting floor, you would make changes to the expenditures. Mm -hmm. The town council, when they deliberate on the mill rate, they would potentially utilize fund balance or set the mill rate in accordance to how, it's, uh, um, how the proposals are reflected here. I will say in, in uh, historical view of how that changes have been made on the annual town meeting floor, um, it usually gets translated into direct mill rate impact without utilization of fund balance. So um, we usually communicate to the townspeople that this proposal of adding or subtracting X from the uh, budget equates into whatever mill rate calculation. So the town, the town floor here doesn't add fund balance utilization. That would be with the town council during their deliberation with mill rate. Okay, so then my proposal then for 500,000 from the capital budget, I'll, I'll just increase that to a million dollars from the capital budget to reduce that and I'll leave it at that. So the, j just for clarification, um, if you wanna make reductions to the town government budget, you have to state which line item, which specific line item in the town budget you want to cut and by how much. But I thought it, for the capital budget that didn't go by, by line item numbers. Is that correct? So you're looking to remove a million dollars from road renewal building improvements. Well, not only, no, not from road, just from roads, but 500,000 from the roads and 500,000 from your capital What's the word? Expenditures? Um, the only thing that you would have is the road renewal. That's it. It would remove a million dollars from road renewal. Re road renewal. Yeah, that seems. That would eliminate yeah. the road renewal. And that wouldn't have an impact. And the the so the t council has been yeah. very and the town has been very purposeful on making sure that we're. Um, cautious around the utilization. Um, for fund balance on capital, and that's why the council was offsetting and utilizing capital uh, for fund balance utilization. So that would likely have a zero impact on your mill rate. Even but if it, I would leave that to the council for their deliberation. Okay, so I'll just leave it at that then. I've got a question, so I understand. Why can't you move, uh, just feasibly, $5 million from general fund to the mill rate? You know, this is just a question to understand what's happening here. That, that is something that wouldn't happen at annual town meeting. Um, if the town council is going to use general fund to offset what the mill rate would be, that's actually done at a later date after the budgets have finally passed. Okay, thank you. It's, so for Michelle, for those in the room, the, the town meeting right now is deliberating on the numbers that are presented before you for total expenditure. And so that's why this group, this body right here, is deliberating on those expenditure numbers. That's separate from the revenue numbers. The council then takes into account those potential changes in revenue when they're looking at the mill rate, setting the mill rate, which is done separately. The motions and the resolution that's before you is setting the expenditure total line items. Does that make sense? You're welcome. Yeah, th uh, thank you very much. The only issue I have with that is that there aren't enough l individual line items to total that amount of money to bring the mill rate down to, to that amount. Jennifer Reynolds, 5 La Fantasy Road. Um, I'm looking at um, page D30, the Killingly Business Association. 
Um, I am a member of that association. We made a request for $5,000 and it was reduced to $3,000. We're comprised of small businesses and the whole organization, everything that we do is on the backs of those small businesses. We're a not-for-profit, so every dollar that we have essentially goes towards the community, from putting on events, to doing plantings downtown, to helping our building structures, um, to promoting our small businesses and getting other businesses to come to Killingly and see how business-friendly we are. So I would like to motion to have that $2,000 put back into that line item to bring us back to our $5,000 original request. Five, La Fantasy Road. KPA Association. Five zero two six six. Yep. And just uh, for those in the room, impact to mill rate two thousand dollars would add would not have an impact to the mill rate. It would still be twenty one point one eight. Their previous expenditures were how much the past two years? We've expended the full because we d we send the money to we them. Give them money to yeah, them. it's okay. a it's an outside agency. Okay. Yeah, no. So the previous two years were three thousand dollars each. Uh, the current years, the current year is five thousand that we expended. Oh, Rookie. yeah. Current year is five thousand. Previous years were so three thousand. We spend the okay. we spend the full amount to the KBA. That's a direct contribution. Mm -hmm. Discussion on this item before we go to vote? Seeing no discussion. All those in favor, raise your cards. Thank you. All those opposed? Motion passes. <clears throat> I'm nervous. <laughs> My name's Cynthia DeMeo, 154 Green Hollow Road. Uh, number one, I have a question. Did the assessor take into consideration the repairs needed on a home? Because if my home was appraised to actually be sold, it would not come close to the new assessment. Um, the revaluation company was the one that um, performed all of the revaluation. So our assessor, the, uh, the ass our assessment team didn't actually do that. That's the revaluation company. And they did send out mailers to everyone to get uh, more information about their individual homes. They do usually grade all of the homes, um, but they would have taken into account uh, relative age of the property as well as potential condition if it was disclosed to them. Uh, we did not get any letter of the sort. They're saying the same thing. I think there were a lot of us that did not get notified of that. So I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. But I propose the income limit for the elderly freeze program to be increased to accommodate those of us on a fixed retirement dash disability income. Us, like the gentleman earlier, are just above that income limit now. And if this assessment amount is to go into effect, we're gonna be hurting. Uh, so the elderly freeze program is a state statute program. Um, and so that would be done, uh, lim any limitations at the state level. And then ultimately the town ordinance would have to be modified. There's a separate process for that, but that can't be done on this floor at the moment. Okay. 
If that is something you would like to be uh, seen done, I would encourage you to come to a regular town council meeting um, and bring that up during public comment period. Thank you. David Simmons, 588 Cook Hill Road, Danielson. Uh, questions regarding the reevaluation. I'm new to this area, haven't lived here all my life. Um, the person who did come, I, I, first of all, I'm curious to find out how much the town paid for the reevaluation committee to appraise all these properties. That's number one. Uh, the second thing is the person who appraised my property did it from the foot of my driveway, which was about 150 feet away never came to the house, never looked inside the house, never looked behind the house. Uh, I received a letter in the mail saying that the property was uh, valued at $110,000 more. Uh, my projected tax increase would be $2,000 a year, uh, which would uh, es essentially be about 48%. I understand that the cost of things are very much more expensive than they have been, however, um, I, when I did appeal with the reevaluation company that did this, um, they told me to get comps. I told them that getting comps would be ridiculous because everything was overpriced and overinflated. My question is, in the event that the real estate market tanks in the next two years, will the town of Killingly drop my taxes down? So as the state statute requires, the town does a revaluation every five years. Every, so I, the, I, town, I, the town's I, requirement is to do a revaluation in five I, years. I get it. I get it. However, what I'm saying is that if the value of the property tanks in the next two years, will the town of Killingly reduce my taxes? And the answer is no. And that's all I have to say. In response to that, I will say that we do have the process of going through the Board of Assessment Appeals. Um, if you feel your property is valued too high, if the town's value came through higher, that is something you can do um, next year. Um, Howie Flexer, 5 Francis Street in Danielson. This is kind of a budgetary question, but more of a policy or procedure question. I know that I've sat through a bunch of revals. Um, could we just get some information about how we bid out this contract, where we bid, what the evaluation process was, and who we used? Is that something I can request, or I have to do that at a town council meeting or via, via formal email? It would be really informational to just kind of figure out how that was evaluated, because again, everyone has said today that these evaluations are all over the map, and they make no sense. So I would like to know what the process was for picking this reevaluation team and having some more information, because I know that other organizations do these regional shared revals, and I don't know if we went out on our own or not, but it would be nice to have more information about how we did the reval, where was it bid, who bid, how do we evaluate, who sure. was the committee. That would be really helpful information, I think, for everyone, so we can understand. My property taxes are going up as well. Um, I, you know, uh, thankfully have the ability to pay that increase, but not everyone does. And I think people fully understanding how my went up $1,000 in addition to what I'm already paying and my neighbor of the same house, same model, same bedrooms, same square footage is, didn't go up. I, I don't understand the process and I've been through the reval uh, as a professional person in the world and here as a taxpayer mm -hmm. and none of this makes any sense and I think giving clarification to taxpayers about how this happened and who chose this company would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So the town did do a uh, competitive bid for the, for the consultant um, and largely in the state of Connecticut, there's three companies that do revaluations that are certified to do municipal revaluations. Um, Tyler Tech Vision and uh, Quality Data. Um, the, and the two largest ones are Vision and Tyler Tech. Um, we went through that bid process. Tyler Tech was the one that was ultimately selected by the evaluation panel, which included the assessor's office, my office, finance, um, in evaluating whether they were responsive to the bid. Um, they were the lowest uh, overall 
per parcel cost. I don't have that figure off the top of my head. I didn't bring that with me. I will gladly share those that um, RFP, those proposals with anyone that would like to have them. Um, but there are, you know, really in the state of Connecticut, there's really only three revaluation companies that are certified to do revaluation. Um, Tyler and Vision are your predominant ones. Um, the regional revaluation that is uh, organized by NECOG um, for the last several times, the last two times at least, um, they've uh, utilized Vision. Um, but uh, those are predominantly your two major providers for revaluation is Tyler Tech and Vision. Tyler was the one that um, performed this one. And they perform revaluations throughout the state. Hi, Jim Silvera, uh, Mason Hill Road, Dayville. So I just wanted to clarify one item. You talked about um, how the credit agencies don't like you to reduce the mill rate by uh, taking money from the fund. Indirectly, you are doing that because you take the capital project, for example. You could easily take that 500000 that he had talked about and put it towards debt servicing instead of towards roads. And I, I think the roads need it, so I'm not suggesting that. My point is it's all in the, how you put the numbers on the piece of paper. So you could easily put that money to reduce debt servicing, and the credit agencies would love you for that. So, and that would look, reduce the mill rate. So it's just a matter of you can't, you can't just say, you know, oh, we can't do that because of that. If the roads need to be paved, I get that. It's a different argument. But there are ways in this budget to still take money from the fund and reduce the mill rate. That's all I have to say. Yeah, I'm not saying that. Silvera? And to be clear, I'm not saying that the, the t that the town council cannot utilize fund balance or the town cannot utilize fund balance to offset debt service. I'm just saying that there are consequences in doing that and what the credit rating agencies, how they would view the utilization of fund balance to, um, to offset annual debt service costs, they, jet, they, would, ha they would likely have, um, they would likely decrease our credit rating. So you're saying that. that if we borrowed less money the credit agencies, because that's what you're talking about doing. No, actually what I'm saying is the credit rating, if you're looking at having it to reduce our debt service, that's reducing how much you're using the fund balance to make essentially your mortgage payments, right? These are your annual debt payments that you have to make for all the various debts that we have, right? For you know the, the various things that we've issued debt for over time. Um, that we're still paying on. We issue 20 year debts, right? So if you're mm -hmm. utilizing the fund balance to lower those payments, that's considered just like if you were going to take savings, money out of your savings sure, account to pay your mortgage, issuing right? New debt as well, right? If you're going to be using it to pay for capital projects so you're not having to issue debt, right. credit rating agencies are fine with that, which is why we're, they're utilizing it to pay for the capital investment in the roads rather than issue debt service for that, right? Then you're not incurring a new debt and not having to borrow money for that. They're using it for that. And that's why it's considered used for capital projects as opposed to paying or lowering, uh, making your annual debt service payments. That's the difference. Michelle Murphy, 325 Breakneck Hill Road. Uh, I am a town councilor, but I'm standing here as a citizen and as a Killingly Republican Town Committee member. Uh, you know, someone said, well, why did you vote for the budget? I think the budget was actually really good. Mary always does a good budget. These guys are tight. As you see when we come up, there's not places to cut. Like, that is the truth. It's tight. I think the school board did a very good job. I, I think Dr. Nash was stupendous this time, but we're all competing against each other. So now I'm standing here as a citizen because I, when I start to get the phone calls and I start to see online how much people are suffering, I think, let me try, even if it is $1,000. Let me try, even if it is $2,000. And I think we can do better. And so, uh, fantastic job, all of us you know, there. Uh, and then you hear what people are struggling with and you think we want to do better. So I'm going to make a suggestion. Um, I try to, uh, I, I don't like the uh, going from part-time to full-time position, parks and grounds, line 50150 D20. And um, I make a motion that we keep that 
for one more year because people are struggling. I don't believe there should be any new positions uh, this year during an assessment year. Uh, so we'll just keep that part time. And you know, we have been subbing out sometimes that we stay doing that. So that's my motion on the floor. I don't know if I have a second. Your name and address. I'm going to just try and summarize that we all know what we're voting on here. And then, okay, so your propo your motion on the floor is to reduce parks um, full time by $28,915, that's the difference to pull them to full time, and to reduce the impact to employee benefits by $17,965, correct? Mm -hmm. So that's the motion on the floor with a second for a total reduction of $46,880. And that would result in a mill rate. Sorry, we're trying to calculate it in real time. That would re that would change the mill rate to uh, twenty one point one five. So that would be a point zero three mill rate reduction to what is currently proposed. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion regarding this? I see a gentleman walking up to speak. I will allow him to speak first. Just a point of um, information. I'm Charles Furl and I live at 86 Knox Avenue. Like a lot of people, I'm paying a lot more taxes, especially than my neighbors. They always get the benefit of the assessment. I don't know why. But my question is, what would this gentleman or lady do to go from part-time to full-time, their services? Because I know there's a problem with the uh, restrooms at the park being clean and open for people. Uh, I don't know what this person would do. So if you could explain that. Sure, so currently uh, it's a seasonal position that would service the town from um, April to largely the end of September, beginning of October. Um, and this funding would move that position to also service the town for the remaining portion of the time. So from October through April, um, they would be you know, assisting in making sure that um, the river trail is um, accessible and open, empty, uh, you know, making sure that we're getting rid of any trash, um, handling any, um, you know, assisting with the um, uh, Christmas lights and decorations that we do at Davis Park, um, and managing additional, um, you know, the trash and the utilization of Owen Bell Park, making sure that we're addressing any vandalism or um, issues that might arise over, over you know, from a day-to-day -day perspective on the various properties, being able to get down to Cat Hollow on a uh, um, on an increased basis um, through the um, winter months. Right now, um, you know, we only have two individuals that are on in the winter months. They, this position would also assist with clearing sidewalks, clearing pathways, uh, salting, or you know, uh, putting out any potential um, you know ice removal components um, around the town property. So the town hall, the library. Um, uh, Soap Street property, um, any of those properties in order to be able to maintain access to all of those when we go through, uh, when we do have a snow or an ice event. So a number of different uh, facets that that position would do during the winter months. Right now we've had to have um, other 
highway and supervisors chip in on those just because there's just not enough manpower. We only have two individuals that manage all of that and they do it even over the weekend. We, we have uh, park staff that report to the parks over the weekend to manage uh, trash and other concerns that may be at the parks over the weekend. This would give them all um, a little bit more um, rotation in the, through the winter months as well. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Oh. Hi, Tom Howard, uh, Chestnut Hill Road. I just had uh, a question, I'm gonna piggyback on the gentleman that was talking about the assessment. Uh, you, uh, you can go to the assessment board. This discussion is just for that one item, that, that one motion that we have right now. Oh, we haven't you can, finished that. Yeah, we okay. haven't finished that yet. You can, you're more than welcome to come back up after okay. we finish this. Thank you. Any more discussion regarding the cut, the motion that's on the floor right now? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your cards. We're gonna have to count this one. They're just trying to verify count, so just please make sure you have it up and up high so that way they can really see it because we're trying to see behind people's. No, so you don't have to stand up. <laughs> just make sure it's up so that way they can tell. Yeah, I know it's hard to see. Okay. All right. Okay. We so have 55 in favor. Those opposed, raise your cards. All right, we don't even have to count. Motion carries. Thank you for being patient with us while we were counting. Adam Griffiths, 98 Griffiths Road. Uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, one, fa fund balance, percentage. That's the first question I'm always going to ask when I hear anything about fund balance. Mary, is what's our percentage at? 25%. 25%. So we're already high on that, right? right? Which means that we've either been taking in extra or we've been ta taxing extra or recouping funds and revenue some way in order to be at that high number, correct? Yeah, largely it's from uh, ongoing, it's been turnbacks um, from unexpended funds with largely with regards to Board of Education. But um, yes, so we have been doing that. 
Correct. The second part of my question is, um, our tax collector in this town is, has done a wonderful job historically, and I know we have new tax collectors. Um, however, do you know our percentage that we've been getting? I know on this report it says 96. I also yep. know that from historically, we get more than 96, even if that's what it's saying. Yes, and so the budgets are, are have been developed um, at a 96% collection rate because that is before the BAA takes action. So before Board of Assessment Appeals takes any decisions, and so that is not necessarily the uh, grand list that is going out for collection. Um, our tax collector, we have been collecting at about um, Nine around 99%, 99.3% has been our average collection over the years. Um, but uh, we knew that with a revaluation, um, there would potentially be a higher number than normal for um, uh, for tax appeal, both with our Board of Assessment Appeals and with the courts. We typically see that every five years with reval. Understood. So where this leads me to say is that if we're saying that we are getting 96%, and we're actually getting 99%. That means every year we are 3% over where we're say what we need. Not necessarily. Because the, board, the BAA has not taken action. So what we're reflecting here is based off of a filed grand list. I understand. Not a collectible grand list. Two different numbers. I, I understand it's a projection. Um, also, on the managers, it's 2 million higher on the uh, current property taxes for 2024-2025 versus the council. What determined that we lost two million? Because if I look in the previous years, it's gone, it's not been a difference of any more than a million in any of those years. And taking all these things into account, it does seem like with our fund balance being high, with our, I understand it's a projection, with our projections always exceeding our 96%, it seems like we are overtaxing. And I say this only because our collectibles are so high, our fund balance is so high, and it looks like now we're also reducing from the council standpoint versus what the manager has selected as the probable property tax revenue. So the reduction in the probable property tax revenue is really based on the cuts that the town council has made. So they reduced, um, uh, you know, the town side of the budget. They also reduced the um, board of education's budget. Um, they reduced um, uh, an amount from capital expenditures that was that was being funded by fund by that was being funded by mill rate calculation. Um, so they eliminated that and made capital projects 100% funded only by fund balance contribution. Um, so the reduction on the on uh, from those tax the the taxable amount the tax revenue is really from the town council's cuts. So you're so you're saying that you have selected current um, property taxes to not be collectible then in order to receive that because no. hold up, because what you said it's this if I'm on page C1. Current property taxes, that would mean our expected amount that we receive from our property owners. It says the manager expects us to get $40,593,000. The council expects us to get $38,423,000. If I look back historically, the most it has ever changed was between 23 and 24 in the last five-year cycle. And that was less than a million. That was, let's see, about 300,000. So I'm wondering, what are we doing to make it such a disparity? One thing I will bring up on this, um, the town manager's budget that was presented to the town council included $1 million that would have been covered by the mill rate for road renewal. The town council elected not to do that because we didn't want that million dollars to hit the mill rate. Now the difference of the two million between a manager's budget and a town council budget is the two million dollars of cuts that we made to the manager's budget. Cuts should have no impact it, on the current property it, tax. It would. They, they it would to. because the mill rate, the the 
revenue for current property taxes is a direct calculation for what the expenditures are needed in order to be, how much is needed from property taxes in order to be able to fund the total expenditures less any other revenue. So it is a direct correlation to the total expenditures. So you're saying also, it's a mill rate cut. That's, that's what you're trying, right? It's total expenditures. Yes, but. An and so it reduces the mill rate calculation. So what you're saying is the manager's budget was a higher Absolutely. mill rate. Yes. Okay. That, that, because that, it was higher that, expenditures. That, that. So it was a higher mill rate. Understood. But okay. the reason is just it's a higher mill rate that you had put out than what the town council had approved. Absolutely. Okay. So that's, Absolutely. So that's well, what the $2 million is in difference there. But I'm still wondering... We're at 25%. Where is the healthy margin that tell, tells us where we should be in the percentage-wise? Sure. So the, um, our fund balance policy that the town has um, has the mill rate, uh, has the fund balance percentage to be between um, 16 and 22%. Um, um, that is essentially, you know, the GASB requirements is that you, um, guideline is that you have two months worth of expenditures or two months of your budget set aside in fund balance. So we do have a higher fund balance, which is why when we were having the conversation with the credit rating agency, they had asked what the town's potential utilization of that was. They did, and they expressed concerns around utilization for operating, but at the same time, if there was a planned utilization with, you know, a step off of that, so there's not a fiscal cliff. That's what their concern is, a fiscal cliff. Understood. So my point still is we're, we're 3% above where that is, where that recommended is. Where does, and I know at a certain percentage that they also start saying you are overtaxing, you are oversaving. Yeah. Yeah. And what percentage does that trigger? Yeah, they weren't um, in our conversations with the credit rating agency. They didn't have that concern at this point in time. You know, you would have to be substantially higher than where we're at right now. And the town has had um, regular um, utilization for capital purposes of the fund balance. So they've been, um, you know, mitigating um, any continued increase on that. But um, so they didn't express any concern around that um, okay. for that. And that three percent, what would that what would that calculate to? I don't have that off the, the top of my between head. Between the twenty-five and the twenty-two to send it to set us back to the higher Hang level. Hang on. Uh, Tammy, can I have the nope, the other one. The one with my fund balance in it. A separate reserve. Hang on, I gotta get there. Understood. Hang on. Nope. My concern is just that we have overages. We collect at more than our um, stated amount. Therefore, the monies that the town is collecting is more than we're expecting normally, and so we have a higher fund balance. And therefore, there's more in that fund balance to still be at the maximum healthy range and still utilize that offsetting taxes if needed. And I'll let you answer that as I take my seat. Thank you. One thing I would like to say is the fund balance where it's at right now at the 25%, a lot of the turnbacks came from the Board of Education surpluses. Um, a lot of that was due to uh, positions that hadn't gotten filled, um, which thankfully at this point they filled a lot of those positions. Um, also, uh, money that wasn't spent during COVID. So there were a few years where the Board of Education was turning back a substantial amount of money. And when the Board of Education has a surplus, at the end of their fiscal year, that money gets put into the general fund. And I do want to make a, cl a clarifying point. So at the, we are projecting at the end of 23-24 to have a projected fund balance of 25%. With the proposed utilization that is before you tonight, that would reduce the fund balance percentage to 20.8%. So you are reducing the utilization, the uh, percentage of fund balance by utilizing it in the, um, in the budget. About two million. 
So that puts us kind of right in that middle point of our um, got, of, of our uh, of our policy between the you know 16 to um, 25 to 22 percent, um, and. And so 1% would be essentially be $722,000, just for easy calculation. Okay. I'm Charles Furlan. I live at 86 Knox Avenue in Daniels. And I got here late. Uh, is there a general motion on the floor to send this budget to referendum as, a, as a modified? You have that well. Yes, yeah. mm. yes I, that motion has been made. Okay, then I'm going to move the question. It's moving the question to send the motion. So that would send the the budget as amended based on the motions that have been made and passed here tonight for a general government appropriations budget of. $24,491,738 um, on the general government appropriations. Um, that number, and then also including the Board of Education appropriation, which has not been discussed yet or modified yet, um, results in a mill rate of 21.15. Yes. Is there a second to move the question? Yep. You have to make. You have to vote on the. Vote on the. Yep. So at this point, um, this vote will be for moving the question. Discussion. Yes. So, so the discussion uh, is this, on whether we move the question yes. yet. So or this not. is just discussion on moving the question. I, I would say that we do not move the question yet, that we uh, fully discuss the Board of Education. And well, I know nope, this, nope, this is just for the town government side. This oh, is right. not for the Board right. of Education side. Uh, well, I have one more suggested cut that's small. Maybe it would go through. It wouldn't go. I don't know if anybody else does, if everybody's done. But I would say we just make sure everybody's done with their motions. Motion on the floor to, there, the motion on the floor is to move the question. Yes, and we are discussing that motion right now. I know that you can't discuss that question. Okay. All those in favor of moving the question, raise your cards. Oh, so the motion, this is all the rules. The motion cannot be discussed or debated. It's a motion that, it's just a motion to approve 
they do the experiment. Yeah. And you just kind of hear it. Okay. All right. So we have 43 in favor of moving the motion to vote. All those opposed? I got 37. Okay. So we had 37 opposed, so the motion carries. So now the motion on the floor. The motion on the floor is to move the general government appropriation budget at $24,491,738 to townwide all day referendum vote. Thank you. And one recommendation I would have is next year we don't use cards that match the color of the seats. <laughs> it makes it difficult to see from here. It's okay, so at this point, we've got a motion. All those in favor, raise your cards. Vote no. on the town budget. This, the this is the vote for the town budget as just read by the town manager. To go to the annual, annual to go to the all day referendum. So you're yes. not voting on approving it. This is going to go to the referendum vote. Yep. This is sending it to the referendum vote. All right. Opposed? Yeah. Motion carries. At this time, we'll move on. On the floor now will be uh, discussion and motions regarding uh, any changes to the Board of Education budget. Um, you cannot make individual line item changes. You can only change the bottom line. Uh, Ian McDonald, 548 uh, Valley Road, Dable. Uh, first, I just wanted to say thank you for mentioning the elderly freeze tonight and uh, as well as somebody mentioned the Board of Assessment Appeals. I don't know how much messaging we're doing about that. Obviously, there's a lot of consternation uh, around the revaluation. Re uh, I think we pro likely probably need to step that up, and, and so that's, um, and, and I, I may have missed something, so I'm not, not, that's not a criticism, but I do think that that needs to be a priority that everybody uh, understands that uh, clearly. Um, in, on a similar subject in terms of just understanding things clearly. I know a few years ago um, we um, were talking about uh, the signage at, at this 
for the town meeting, and somebody made a motion, I think it was, uh, to increase signage more generally, and it was kind of discussed, well, we have that in our budget, we don't really need that. I'm a little disappointed that maybe it may have been in, in Danielson and I missed it, but at the entrance here, I, I wasn't seeing an annual town meeting. Um, I think it's a obviously important uh, meeting for, I think that's obvious to everybody here. I think we possibly could have a lot more people here. And I think there was an acknowledgement that that was a, a felt need uh, kind of across the board. And, and I think we, we still haven't quite got, gotten there with that. And I don't know that it requires more resources, but I do think we need to, to step that up. Um, in terms of the, I think it's important when we talk about the school uh, budget that we're not conflating the uh, understandable consternation around the revaluation with, with the school budget as such. Um, I think, you know, one thing I think we do need to do going forward is, is really get an assessment on how this particular revaluation company, uh, as much as we can, I know there's limited, we might have limited means to do that, but stacks up versus others in the state. Um, you know, there's a, obviously a lot of concern there. Uh, I've mentioned this before, I'll say it again, uh, in terms of the school budget, the initial proposed school budget was coming in at 3%. Uh, inflation rate was 3.5%. I realize this is not a one-to-one -one comparison, but when people look at the budget and they say, oh my God, it's going up this much. We, everybody knows there's inflation generally in the economy. The school doesn't get to live in a bubble entirely outside of that, and some of their expenses uh, certainly reflect that. Um, in terms of the non-lapsing funding, um, maybe we can get some clarity on this, but um, I'm just wondering, you know, there are additions made at these meetings uh, at times, and uh, I think not fully funding the non-lapsing uh, threatens a mill rate increase. I think it's, you know, there's mechanisms to return some of that to taxpayers if we really wanted to do that uh, from the non-lapsing account, uh, but I think really fully, f there are no mechanisms to do that. No, any funds that are uh, put into the non-lapsing account can only be used by, for educational purchases, purposes by the Board of Education per state statute. So once the money's in the non-lapsing account, um, the town council has no control over how the Board of Education expends those funds. Um, that's all Board of Education's purview. Okay. And it has to be used for educational purposes is the language in the state statute. But the following year, there's no ability to use out those resources in any ways to offset uh, cost to taxpayers. Um, I will leave this to the superintendent if she wants to address this, because I know she had discussed um, possibly using the non-lapsing account to cover any unanticipated overages on special education, which is actually what the non-lapsing account was initially started for by the state. Sure, I could speak to that, <clears throat> excuse me. So the non-lapsing fund really doesn't have any limitations. Um, we can be used for anything that is, has an educational purpose. So in recent history, we've used our non-lapsing for some capital projects. We do have some more capital projects that we'll be using our non-lapsing for. This year, um, we have built, as you saw in the presentation, that if we do need additional special education tuition, we would be using our non-lapsing for that. Hopefully that answered your question. I think it did, but what, what I'm talking about is, and I, I might be misunderstanding this, so I apologize. If the non-lapsing count isn't spent down fully at that point, can, can some? Oh, it continues on to the next year, okay. and then it can be filled back up, yes. Okay. So, you know, I, I still think fully funding that would probably give us a little buffer for the mill rate, and I, I would, would endorse that. The last thing I'll just say is that, you know, when we talk about the school budget, and, and I, I certainly understand that some folks are, are really feeling some pain in terms of the revaluation, and I, I don't want to minimize that, um, but I do think, you know, I have a couple of kids in the school system, and I only say that to, to note that, I haven't really had the experience of them coming home and me looking at what they're doing 
what kind of you know, materials they have, what kind of field trips they're taking. I went through the Killingly schools. Parents and grandparents went through the Killingly schools. I haven't had the experience uh, maybe with a minor exception of during COVID, there was some technology just to deal with the distance learning. But I haven't had the experience of being like, wow, you guys are really living it up here. <laughs> this is lavish. We never had that. If I'm being honest, a lot of times I think, well, I had more field trips than you. And, and I, you know, I look at, I don't know, in 1969, you know, Jerry Fillmore had a 300-piece marching band. So I think for people who have been in this town for a while, I, I understand that there, there may be, there's real pain with the revaluation, but I think we need to be careful at assuming that the school is, is really this kind of lavish thing. That, that, that certainly hasn't been my experience. Um, and um, and, and the la you know, last thing I'll say too is I had a conversation with, with somebody the other day, and I, I realize this is anecdotal, but uh, they, were, they had moved to Killingly a few years ago and you know, I say, we were just talking, and they said, well, I don't know about the school system. I'm like, well, what do you mean? You, you have an issue with a teacher or something? And she said, no. Teachers have been fine, but my student had some special needs, and they were really having difficulty getting the extra help they needed and, and compared with the other schools they had been in. So that's just an anecdote, but I do think that there's probably a lot of folks that might f be in a similar position and so I just hope we uh, have an honest assessment of where schools are at. And I know everybody's doing the best with what they have, but I, I don't think it's a lavish situation, and I don't think this is a lavish, lavish budget. And um, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm a little concerned on the laps fund. I know it's vague, but you say you can use it for education. Well, I'd rather see it used for the purpose of just what, it, what they're using it for, for a special, special education. Because, let's face it, mental health it's really critical now, still, in, around nationwide. It's going to get more. So I'd like to see it used as a buffer rather than fixing an educational, maybe the roof or something at the education thing or any other kind of education thing. I'd rather see it just, just for that purpose of, and, and as, a bud, as a buffer because I think we're going to get in trouble because I think there's going to be more mental health issues, and I think it should begin that. Thank you. Thank you. John LaBelle, 57, Island Road, Dayville. First of all, I want to thank everyone for all the effort they've put into creating these budgets, and uh, I know that it, it is very time consuming and people are working hard at it. Thank you. The, I have several questions. One is the, where does the remaining funds, the LAPS funds show up in any of these budgets that goes back to the town or I don't see where the funds show up. John, and I just calculations. Want, John, I want to clarify your question. Are you asking where does the non-lapsing funds show up in the budget or the remaining unspent Board of Education funds? I just want to clarify that question. The, remain, the remaining funds. The unspent funds, not the non-lapsing account. Right. The uns, okay. They would just go to the general fund fund balance. But they don't show up in these calculations? Correct. So we show the fund balance availability, how much the fund balance is that was in a scheduled in the manager's budget, but that um, is just part of the uh, general government overall f uh, fund balance. Um, it's not reserved or held by the Board of Education. They can't hold funds after the close of the fiscal year. So we're, we're not seeing those funds in these calculations? 
they are being, fund balance is being utilized to do the capital pavement management, road pavement management plan, um, but it is not used for offsetting operational costs in this budget. Okay, the second question I have is, in 2023, the Connecticut General Statutes allowed for, in this case, the, the council to make recommendations to the Board of Education as to how spending recommendations and suggestions um, so that they may consolidate non-educational services and realize financial efficiencies. Contrary to what we believe here tonight. And I, I wonder if council did push back on the Board of Education for specifics recommendations. Now, it also goes on to say that the Board of Education can refuse those uh, recommendations, but requires the Board of Ed to submit a letter in writing as to why they refuse those recommendations. An observation that I have, the mill rate, has been reduced by about 20%. Is that an accurate observation? If the average increase in assessment is about 40%, where's the disparity in the two? How can we have a mill rate that goes down to 20% and, this, and the assessments up 40%? There's a 20% gap. Can someone explain as to what I'm missing here? Um, so the average assessments went up 40, but that doesn't mean that all assessments went up 40. So it's a bell curve, you know, as you're well aware. So the um, some went up far less than that. Others went up far more than that. Um, the, you know, the grand list, the mill rate is based on the accumulation of um, how much expend, how much revenue needs to be generated in, in order to be able to cover the expenditures. So, um, you know, there is a correlation, but not a direct correlation from the, val the median increase in property value to the percentage increase or decrease in the mill rate, right? Um, because property values, it's only the median that increased by 40 it goes all the way across the board um, and that um, it doesn't have that direct correlation of pro median property value went up 40% and the mill rate goes down by 20%. It's not a direct correlation. And if I remember correct, the 40% was just residential? Yeah, that's what okay. I'm seeing. So, uh, which the residential side is 54% of the grand list. You have another 46% which is comprised of commercial, um, motor vehicle, personal, personal property. Um, so we didn't see 40% across all of those. The 40% that was referenced was the just the residential side. Which is that my mental calculation was still about a 10% off. Do you know what the exact numbers were for average increase or decrease on commercial and then personal property and I motor vehicle? I honestly don't have those in front of me. Um, uh, for okay. commercial, there was an increase of, I believe, the presentation that the town council had gotten was somewhere around the mid 20 percent. Um, and I, I haven't looked at, I can't say I haven't looked at it. I've looked at it, I just don't have the numbers committed to memory and I don't want to misspeak for personal property, uh, motor vehicle does overall have a decrease. So um, there's offsetting components there. And I share, I share Mr. Griffith's comments about being careful of overtaxing, over, be careful about overtaxing people. I never believed in that and we should be taxing at the rate of the money that we need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.
Howie Flexer, Five Friends of Street, Danielson. I'm just looking for a clarifying question. I know that the town council has reduced the proposed Board of Edge budget by $703,722.22. So does that cut um, impact the already agreed to contractual increases? And if there is a difference between the contractual increases that both the Board of Ed and the Town Council have previously approved for the contracts that are going to be renewed and extended for next year. What is the dollar difference between what is cut and what the Board needs to fulfill those contractual increases? I just, I didn't know if I did the math correctly, so I just wanted some clarification. So in the presentation, there is um, a chart that says, you know, what is the Board of Education budget with town council reductions? And it does have a line for salaries. Um, so we have not, I'm not sure if I'm gonna answer your question properly, but of course any reduction is going to um, potentially have an impact on positions, like you're mentioning contracted positions we reduced in other ways so that it would not have an impact. The cuts, 703,000, would not have any impact to the contracted salaries. And the salaries here are not broken out, uh, broken out contracted um, versus non-contracted. It's just one group of salaries. Okay, I just, I wasn't sure because I want to make sure that the district is meeting its contractual obligations right. as they exist. So if yes. I'm looking at the reductions on whatever page this one, the town council reduction page, and the salaries, the difference is $234,000, give or take? Yes. So is that something that would be advantageous for someone to make a motion to put the $234,485.04 back into the Board of Ed budget in order to meet all the salary obligations for the following year. So I will say that we are meeting all of our obligations for contracts. That's uh, the reason why we made the adjustments in other areas. We did not uh, cut positions. But are there So, Halloween, I think what she's, just so I can Oh, yeah, clarify. I just want to, I was just trying to, yeah. to verify that we're so, going to be able to meet our contractual obligations right. for all of the things that were approved yeah. through yeah. all the processes so, that are So, just looking at the spreadsheet that, that Dr. Nash provided, um, the, she's recognizing those contractual obligations of 900000 mm -hmm. but obviously they've reduced, they, so she's, re they've reduced in those other areas to make up for that $200,000 that you're concerned about. So it appears that based on those calculations on the sheet that you're referencing, that contractual obligation is intact. Um, but it looks like, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sue, um, I'm just trying to, you know, provide that assistance, but it looks like that that is intact yes. from what uh, she has re reflected on that sheet. Yes, all of our contractual ob obligations will be met. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Nash, I just want one clarification. Um, when you were going over your presentation before, um, and uh, because Ms. Flexer had brought up the salary line, you had talked about a 132% increase in the salary line. Just for clarification, that's not an actual 132% increase. That's just the percentage of the increase. That is correct. Okay, all right. Um, so based off my understanding, the uh, all the reductions that you had spoken about before, um, I didn't see any positions that are currently filled that would be getting cut at the budget level that the town council had put forward, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, just one more question. I just was hoping to get some clarity on. Um, on June 4th, I think you guys have a meeting to fully fund, or not to fully fund, but to uh, vote on uh, increasing funding for the uh, non-lapsing account. Is that, is that correct? Or Yes, that is separate from the Board of Education budget. Okay. Um, 
but I would say that I'm not sure, I think that seems potentially uh, relevant uh, to this meeting. I don't know, um, maybe there, there probably was good reason for it, but I don't know why that is happening after this meeting instead of before it. That seems like that would have made sense to have that meeting uh, before this one. The timing of that meeting, we had to wait for the financial audit to get done um, before any money can be deposited, um, f moved from the general fund into the non-lapsing account. Mm -hmm. So it was okay. just timing of when the audit was done. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. You're welcome. And just another thing that was brought up was the transfer is actually out of the surplus from the 2022-2023 budget, not the current budget we're in. Any more comments? Mr. Anderson, if I wanted to comment, do you want me to go over there or can I sit here? No, you can comment from there. Okay. Um, Susan Lannon, 5010 Hartford Pike Extension. For transparency, I am the chairperson of the Board of Education. Um, usually at this point we say we're speaking as an individual, but I'm going to speak as the chairperson and thank my colleagues for all being here tonight to defend our budget and hear what you have to say about it. Um, as an individual, uh, well actually, I, I wanna give some background too. The Board of Education meets as the board um, and deliberates our budget weekly um, for a very lengthy amount of time after the administration deliberates and meets extensively to present budgets. Dr. Nash touched on this, but the budget that the district presented to the Board of Education was um, brought to her. She immediately asked for a reduction. It was brought to the Board of Education. We, at that point, had deliberated um, quite a bit and then at our, our board meeting, we deliberated again and voted unanimously for the Board of Education budget that was prevented, presented to the town council. I am proud of us for that, and I will say it out loud, because it was unanimous and it was a lot of work. Um, and we took a lot of things into account, the needs of the, of the students, of the people we serve in this community, but also at heart, the um, education. As an individual, the assessment calculator on the town council, on the T Killingly Town website was very helpful. Our taxes are increasing due to the assessment that went out, the revaluation. I calculated that value um, so I could pre prepare for the next year based on the town council budget and then out of curiosity, I calculated my personal tax rate as if the town council said yes to the Board of Education budget, and the difference in my taxes was $80. Um, this slide here that we just spoke about, um, the town council budget education with council reductions, while it does, yes, support that we can contractually meet all of our salary obligations, that is line 100. In order to do so, we need to take cuts from lines 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, and 800. Um, so it's not that we're just meeting them, we are taking the money from other places if the money, um, if the budget is given to us. I have concerns about that. Um, uh, also, another elephant in the room is the, the non-lapsing fund versus the fund balance fund. We've heard the town council and the town manager say tonight that they are not willing to use um, or can't use their fund balance because their credit rating goes down. Yet I feel as though the, this budget is forcing the Board of Education to use our non-lapsing account. Um, and the, the two are the essential, in my opinion, for layman terms, savings accounts. So I suppose that is my individual opinion on the town budget on the Board of Education budget. But th and again, just thank you all for being here. And thank you all. Any further discussion or motions? Seeing none, we'll move the question. So 
So the Board of Education budget would be as presented by the Town Council at $47 million. $508,839. And that would go to the, this motion would be passing this to the all day referendum, which would be held next week on the 14th. Thank you. All those in favor, raise your cards. Or wait. You had. Hang on. What, where did you had, you had the, the initial motion. In the initial motion. The initial motion was for both. Yep. Yeah. You're fine. Yeah. I had the initial motion. You're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? Sure. Yeah. All right. So all those in favor, you got your cards raised. Opposed. Motion carries. Motion to adjourn. At this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Who is the second? Who is the second? Adam, Adam. Adam Griffiths. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. How, how could you not know it was Adam? Meeting is adjourned.